Um, my name is Kevin Corbett. I'm the uh, General Counsel and Company Secretary of Gallifer Tri. For those of you who are not aware, uh, it's a house builder and, and construction company. Uh, I am also a, a chartered structure engineer. I, I practiced uh, engineering for a number of years uh, before uh, taking up uh, law. So in this short session, just what I want to do is just give us a sort of quick world stop tour through you know, the law, uh, the contracts that you kind of will find yourselves entering into or, or advising upon. Uh, there is a bit of risk management in there because it's so much, uh, so it's such an important part of, of contracts and, and what you need to take into account. And then there's a little section on sort of designers and professionals that's uh, very relevant to everybody here. Uh, I do have to talk about disputes because uh, some of you may already painfully have been involved uh, in disputes. It doesn't matter really whether you're uh, the claimant uh, seeking uh, some sort of uh, redress or, or whether you're the subject of the dispute or possibly even in a sort of expert witness role. And then I've got a final slide which is just sort of takeaway, useful sort of takeaways that you should perhaps take away hopefully uh, from this session. So just a quick history here of, of the law and, and how it relates to us in particular. Um, contract law and tort law uh, developed uh, basically in the 19th and 20th centuries, but it was really uh, after the Second World War and, and the huge construction program uh, that was required uh, that meant, meant a lot of construction contracts, a lot of construction works was undertaken. And it was in those construction contracts uh, that a lot of uh, issues came to court, uh, which led to a significant development in, in the contract law that we have today uh, and, in fact, in the tort of negligence. Um, you'll be aware, actually, there are two, basically, uh, main ways in which law is created uh, in the UK. It's created in the courts by judges who set precedents in certain levels of court. They'll make a decision about how to interpret a contract or how to take a view on a set of facts. That becomes law that the other courts will follow, precedent law. And then, of course, the primary way law is created in the UK is in Parliament uh, statute law. Uh, and, of course, there, is, there are lots of laws that impact uh, our daily lives. Uh, and in construction, in structural engineering, not least those would be health and safety, environment. Uh, more recently, the Construction Act and the payment disputes that you have under there. Uh, Misrepresentation Act and, of course, the power of the cons consumer uh, and the power that's given to them under the Consumer Credit Act. So contracts, um, legally binding. Uh, a contract can be, can be created orally. It can be created by a simple exchange of letters. It can be exchanged, it can be created by email. Uh, and then, of course, you have bespoke forms. That's forms that uh, lawyers uh, spend a lot of time drafting on behalf of clients. Uh, and you have industry standard forms, uh, which I'll talk about <coughs> in a moment. Uh, the parties to a contract, uh, a typical construction contract, are wide uh, and very general, you know, whether it's the employer, uh, funder, in investors in the project, uh, right down through to subcontractors and manufacturers. <coughs> uh, you essentially need four elements uh, to create a legally binding contract. Uh, you need uh, an agreement, you need offer uh, and acceptance of that offer, a promise to do something uh, and uh, an agreement to do that. Um, not all agreements create a contract. Um, if I arrange to see my daughter for lunch on Friday, uh, we may well enter into agreement, but we won't necessarily uh, have entered into a, a contract. Uh, entering into contract, there has to be an intention to be legally bound. The courts recognise social situations or uh, other areas where there's not an intention to be legally bound. Um, there has to be certainty as to terms. I'll talk about some of the terms in a moment. Uh, but certain certainty around uh, the fee, the price, certainty around what has to be delivered. Um, if you don't have certainty of terms... Uh, there is potential for the contract uh, to be null and void. Uh, and then all contracts have to have a consideration or price, which typically in our case would be a fee. Um, there are certain contracts such as deeds where you don't need to have a, a consideration, uh, but they are pretty far and few between. So most contracts will have sort of some basic terms in them, which will be the price, that, that, by that I mean the fee, uh, the scope, um, I'll come back to talk about scope in a minute because it is so important in contracts, particularly in the contracts that you enter into, to make sure that you define and are very clear about the scope between you and your client. Uh, performance obligations, what is it expected of you under the contract and what sort of level of skill is required. Um, insurance uh, uh, is another area which will typically be stipulated in the contract. 
uh, termination, how you can get out of the contract, as well as how the client uh, can terminate your services. And then there will often be stuff about program timing in terms of delivery of services. And invariably, these, these days, contracts will have some sort of dispute resolution as to how you can uh, resolve issues that arise under the contract. I mentioned there about scope. Um, a lot of issues that I see are simply a breakdown in communication between the client uh, and the party providing the services. It is really important for you to try and define uh, in your arrangement with your client exactly what you are going to do. Uh, invariably, the client will think you're going to do X, Y, and Z, whereas you will have priced or you'll put a fee in and you will think you're only having to do X. Uh, if you can be very clear at the outset as to your scope obligations, you will save a lot of trouble uh, down the line. Um, we, we, we do get sent, I'm sure you guys get sent standard forms, and my firm uh, issues standard forms as well. Um, so the industry, industry has developed a number of contract, uh, family, contract forms, families uh, that are used, uh, and different types of projects tend to use different standard forms. So, so major infrastructure in the UK will tend to use the NEC, uh, that was used on the Olympics, uh, it's also currently being used on Crossrail, and it will be used on high speed also. Um, international projects, for those that you do any work overseas, uh, FIDIC is a very common form, uh, and also, oddly enough, here in the UK, it seems to be very popular uh, if you're involved in any form of uh, wind farm. UK building works, uh, simple building works, commercial buildings, uh, do tend to use uh, the JCT standard forms. And then designers and consultants, structural engineers, um, they will typically use, if they're using a standard form, will typically use the ACE or the NEC professional forms. Um, they are quite useful forms to use. The ACE, for example, does a short form, uh, which is a very simple form to use, and it does bring a sort of, um, it brings a sort of discipline to make sure that you include some of the very important provisions that you need to include in your contract, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the reason we have standard forms is to ensure that um, each contract doesn't need to be negotiated. Uh, lawyers could make lots and lots of money if every time uh, there was a project to be built, uh, they had to uh, d uh, draft an individual contract for that uh, project. Uh, so it does, in theory, save uh, industry cost in terms of procuring projects. Um, it does make it more straightforward for employers uh, to be able to do so. The other idea for standard form contracts is to have a kind of standardized risk profile in those contracts. So who's responsible for weather conditions, who's responsible for ground conditions, who's responsible for insuring insurance and insurance arrangements on the projects. And the other idea about contracts is, of course, they have certainty. Standard form contracts have certainty. Where there have been issues in the past, they will have been to court, uh, and the judge will have made a decision as to how to interpret any issues that arise in that contract. Uh, the problem that we have in my business and in your business as well is when you're working under standard forms is that quite often they will be amended and the risk profile uh, can change uh, quite significantly or dramatically. And that's where we need to really talk and think about a little bit about risk management. So procurement, uh, whether it's UK or overseas, variety of forms and procurement routes available for clients and their projects. Obviously, all projects that we enter into uh, involve uh, an element of risk. Uh, and projects do, construction projects do tend to be complex. Uh, they involve complex uh, issues, uh, designs, and they often, and they will always involve a multitude of various parties participating in that project. Um, it is also worth to think about the legal jurisdictions. Uh, if you're obviously working in the UK, uh, there are the standard forms that I've just referred to, uh, and there's that freedom to contract that we have under the common law. Uh, and you have to kind of compare that uh, to other systems, Germany, France, and Greece, where they have a sort of codified system, and that's where a lot of the contract, that, a lot of the laws that you'll see in your contract, provisions you see in your contract, are actually codified under statute uh, in those uh, jurisdictions. So just thinking about some of the risks uh, that can be uh, transferred under contract, and here are some of the legal risks, uh, unlimited liability. Um, the standard forms that I spoke about, whether it's ACE or NEC, they have a provision in them that allows you to cap your liability under contract. <coughs> Designers will typically cap their liability at, at their fee or some sort of multiple of, of the fee. And basically what that means is, is that if there is a, a dispute under the contract, 
if it's drafted appropriately, and hence the importance of the standard forms, then your liability under that contract will be capped at that agreed figure uh, in the contract. It's very important because if you're silent uh, in your contract as to uh, a cap on liability, then you will actually have unlimited liability. So in theory, uh, you could be sued uh, for, what, for, for all of the losses you cause, whatever losses they may be. Um, the performance ob under ob obligations in a contract, what they're stated are, is very important. Um, and uh, I've mentioned here fitness for purpose. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But the two standards that you have under contract, um, it's important that you don't have in your contract unusual standards of care, high levels of care that you wouldn't typically have in law. Uh, joint and several liability. I'm not sure how many people here ever get involved in a project where they enter into joint venture, possibly with another firm of consultant engineers, possibly with a contractor. The position under UK law is that if you're a joint venture in a joint venture, uh, you are liable uh, for all faults under that joint venture agreement. So, for example, if you're in joint venture with a contractor and the joint venture contractor causes a massive loss and for whatever reason it's not able to uh, repay that loss or pay the damages arising from that loss, uh, then in theory uh, the client in law uh, can seek full recovery from you no matter how small your proportion is in that joint venture. Um, the standard forms such as the ACE and the uh, NEC have standard exclusion clauses uh, which is very important. Um, there was a recent case two weeks ago, court of, uh, court of Appeal decision two weeks ago, where house builder Persimmon uh, was suing uh, Arab uh, in connection with uh, a claim for asbestos. Uh, Arab, in their standard form, excluded liability uh, for asbestos, uh, and the court enforced uh, the exclusion clause, gave a very broad meaning to that exclusion clause that was in the Arab contract. Uh, warranties, and, uh, warranties and reliance to third parties. More and more these days, if you're involved in a building project where there are tenants or where there are funders, in addition to your contract with your client, you may find yourself having to provide collateral warranties uh, uh, to other parties, thereby exposing you to even potentially greater risks. I again put at the end there the importance of the scope obligation, and I will keep repeating that. Uh, if you get the scope obligation, if you get the scope defined clearly in your contract, that you do limit uh, uh, the risk of, of, of issues at the end of the project or during the project. Uh, commercial uh, types of risk that can be transferred under contract, obviously we've spoken about financial limits of liability and the fact that you can cap your liability in, in contract and the law will enforce that. Uh, there are also liquidated damages. You may find contracts that have a stipulated liquidated damages, damages that are a pre-subscribed rate of damages that will be paid in the event of default typically delay, but it can be other issues. Um, you will see designers under an obligation to incorporate in their design scope change, uh, including the reworking of design. Uh, if you have that in your contract and you're prepared to accept it, you need to set your fee accordingly. If your fee does not allow for that, then that's a provision that would need to be struck out. There may also be requirements for bonding and, and parent company guarantees uh, for those firms that are part of, of a larger group. Um, and then, of course, payment provisions are, are, are obviously very important in your contract as to when you'll be paid and how you'll be paid. Just some uh, comments here for specifically for designers and professionals. Um, now, uh, as structural engineers, um, the role can vary uh, enormously. It can be a very specialised role, or it could be one where you're leading the overall design team as well as supervisory responsibility for the project. The stages can vary from inception uh, through to detailed design, uh, possibly even to assist in the client. One of the ways I got into the law was assist in the client with the choice of contract forms, uh, tendering selection, selection of suppliers uh, and contractors. Then, of course, you may also have a role involved on site in terms of production, in terms of supervision of the project, in terms of quality control, in terms of cost control, and in terms of uh, monitoring the works for compliance uh, with the design. Now, I mentioned before about uh, levels of skill that may be specified in contract. In law, uh, a structural engineer, and indeed all professionals, uh, has a duty to use reasonable skill and care. So that's what the law imposes on you. So if your contract is silent, that will be uh, how you are measured uh, by the courts and should be by your client as well. 
There's, there's two tests. Uh, the first test is the standard required is that of a reasonable professional practice in his field of practice. So if you have a problem on a project and an expert comes along, he, he will judge you the, and the judge will judge you based on how your colleagues would have carried out that same task. Reasonable, reasonable professional practice in, in that particular field. Uh, the things you have to avoid in the contract is these higher levels that a client may try uh, and impose, uh, and that's such as a fitness for purpose obligation, where there is then an absolute obligation uh, that you are guaranteeing the performance of, of your design. Uh, it's a very onerous obligation. Uh, it's not one that you are required to do in law, and it's one that you should make sure uh, you do not have arise in, in your contracts. Um, very important part for professionals uh, and for structural engineers is, the, is insurance. I, I know Stephen is going to uh, talk to you this afternoon about insurance, but it is, uh, uh, there is uh, professional indemnity insurance that can be taken out to cover claims suffered as a result uh, of negligence, uh, such as uh, design error, incorrect advice, uh, negligence uh, and omissions. The other important thing about PI insurance, of course, is, is that if you have an absolute obligation, fitness for purpose <coughs> obligation, um, your insurance may not cover you uh, for, uh, for fitness for purpose obligation. It may be excluded from the policy. <coughs> so I just want to mention something here about disputes uh, and, and why, why is dispute resolution so important. Um, we know the industry in, is, is complex uh, and involves lots of parties involved in delivering a project. And you can have all sorts of claims on contracts, but it's not unusual to have claims regarding pay, regarding delay, regarding changes in design, regarding alleged errors uh, in design uh, and defects. Um, in the UK, the main forums uh, for resolving disputes are the traditional forum, which is basically the High Court or arbitration. Arbitration is becoming less and less popular now, uh, not least uh, because it's become as complicated as the High Court. Um, under the Construction Act, you have the right to adjudication, and then pre-formal, before launching actually uh, detailed uh, uh, disputes, uh, there is the opportunity for mediation. Important to remember that under contract, you can, uh, you can specify uh, what dispute forum uh, you will use, and the standard forms uh, will always do that. Uh, disputes in the High Court, uh, a judge appointed by the court, it's a, he gives a judicial ruling, um, there are strict rules and strict timetables that are entirely managed by the judge. Uh, in the UK, you have a high standard of judge, high standard of justice being delivered, uh, but it is a formal and strict environment, and, and the other factor, of course, is, is that it's public. It's in the public domain. Arbitration, um, very popular amongst commercial parties, used to be very popular amongst commercial parties, uh, because not least because the parties can choose the arbitrator, uh, and the arbitrator would typically be chosen depending on the nature of the dispute. So if it's a mechanical electrical engineering dispute, you'd appoint an M&E uh, engineer as your arbitrator, and similarly if it was a structural engineering dispute, you'd appoint a structural engineer. Uh, the arbitrator's decision, just like a judge's decision, is final and binding, uh, and the parties have much greater control over the timetable, unlike uh, court proceedings. Uh, it is very popular with technical disputes in the commercial world, um, and it is a private uh, procedure, so the outcome of that procedure, outcome of the arbitration itself, uh, remains entirely confidential. Adjudication. All construction engineering contracts have a statutory right to adjudication. Um, probably 99% of the contracts that you are involved in will have a statutory right uh, to adjudication. Um, adjudication is kind of known as a quick and dirty resolution of dispute, has a very short timetable, um, uh, but it does uh, 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 resolve disputes. It has a neutral third party who is appointed <laughs> by the parties uh, to act as an adjudicator. And the decision of the adjudicator is binding and enforceable, just like a judge's decision. However, it can subsequently be challenged uh, in the court if there is a view that the adju adjudicator completely got the wrong decision. It is now the standard method of resolving the majority of disputes in construction engineering. Uh, the High Court uh, and the Construction Court will tell you uh, that the number of cases have fallen dramatically since the introduction of adjudication, uh, as it is a key and quick way of resolving disputes. Uh, mediation. Um, you should be encouraged that if you are about to launch on a dispute, 
uh, to try and see if you can mediate, resolve it amicably without, uh, oh. the, without the costs and the complication of court proceedings. Um, it will also be promoted by the courts. So at the first hearing, the judge will say, have you guys thought about uh, uh, resolving your, your dispute by way of uh, mediation? Uh, the mediator is appointed by the parties, a bit like an arbitrator, and his task is to help the parties uh, find a resolution to their dispute. Uh, mediation is consensual. Uh, the mediator will not make a decision. He will not give a judgment. Uh, there are potential for significant cost uh, and time savings by using mediation to resolve any dispute. <coughs> and most importantly, it does help maintain business relationships. It's consensual, uh, and the process is also strictly confidential. And I've just got a final slide where I try and wrap up uh, these key points. I mean, under the contracts, uh, and, and I know, uh, and I'm probably as guilty of this as anybody else, uh, when you get a contract, you can tend to stick it in the bottom drawer. Uh, but it is important to read the document uh, and to highlight uh, those obligations uh, that are relevant uh, to you. Uh, anything you see in there unusual, flag it up and make sure you're aware of it. Comes back to the scope. Understand your scope and try and make sure your client understands what you're going to deliver. Um, I do think it's important to understand the exit strategy. You may find in your contract that you want to get out of it uh, and it's important that you have the right to do that and how easy it is to do it. Um, for professional designers, uh, the key, undoubtedly, two takeaways is to make sure the contracts that you enter into do not impose upon you an obligation greater than reasonable skill and care. Uh, and I would say the importance of professional indemnity insurance, but you will hear more about that this afternoon. Then in dis disputes, um, uh, they should be avoided at all costs. Uh, they are very expensive. They are very damaging uh, to all parties. Uh, and I would certainly recommend, if you have any option at all, try and resolve your